Welcome, my name's Dr. Jason W. Morrison and I'm a theologist from New South Wales, Australia. Psychologists help people with themselves and other people and theologists help people with themselves and God. Welcome, I'm Dr. Jason W. Morrison, theologist, New South Wales, Australia and let's have a look at this. 2,000 years after the crucifixion, men claiming to be Christ are still making headlines. And one in particular has made more headlines than most. I've been given exclusive access to what the media has described as one of the world's most worrying cult leaders, Alan John Miller. Actually, I've had a 2,000 year life and and my name is Jesus as well, so I was born Jesus of Nazareth in the first century. He has been compared to David Koresh, the cult leader whose followers died in a mass fire at Waco. He has been described as the face of evil, with apocalyptic predictions for the end of the world. He breaks up marriages and uses his followers for sexual favours. A friend of mine came to me one day and he said, I met this bloke and I reckon he's Jesus. You know, how arrogant is that and, and what a wanker. I have read he has a compound and his followers are setting up home with him. Alan John Miller, or AJ as he likes to be known, believes he is Jesus and he's deadly serious. The Roman soldiers weren't certain as to whether I died or not yet. And so they actually speared the side of my body uh, up into the heart. And the world's media are taking note as he broadcasts his teachings on the net. I'm Jesus, but most people call me AJ or Alan John Miller. I'm claiming to be Jesus, that's true. Um. <laughs> How does it feel though, Jesus talking to us today and everybody watching at home and knowing that 99.9% .9 of that audience are mocking you, are laughing at you, are saying this man it's bonkers, and she must be as bad as him. <laughs> He's invited round the globe to teach divine truth with his partner, Mary Luck, who also believes she is reincarnated. Oh my God, this is, this is true. Like, this guy is Jesus and I remember it. And actually, I remember who I am. Like, I understand who I am now. I had to agree to be filmed and hand over my footage in order for me to get exclusive access to AJ and Mary. I travelled 10,000 miles to his remote home in the Australian bush, an area known as the Bible Belt, to find out the truth behind the media claims. If in fact, the divine truth is a cult, and AJ is a cult leader, then I wanted to know what AJ was trying to teach why people were listening and whether he is any different from the many men who have claimed to be Jesus before. And if he's really Jesus and I really believe that, holy crap, I've got to, I really got to embrace all the things he's saying. AJ used to be a property developer and IT professional, but gave it all up 10 years ago in the realization he is Jesus. Five years ago, he met Mary Luck who believes she is Mary Magdalene. We took a three hour drive into the heart of the bush and the Australian Bible Belt to AJ and Mary's remote home, where it has been reported police were called because screams were heard from the Divine Truth community of worshippers who have set up home in his compound. I was eager to find out the truth behind these worrying claims. It was soon apparent there was no community, no worshippers, and no compound. It's incredible that a claim can be made like that, I find. Yeah. Because I'm here yeah. and I'm seeing it for myself. Yeah. And, and it was a purposeful claim. The people who made the claim stayed with us for two days. So they actually knew. That we just have a little yeah. two bedroom house, house with no fences <laughs> and just we live here. <laughs> Christians and Muslims alike believe in the second coming of Christ and for a millennia hundreds of men have professed to be Jesus himself. It is written in the Bible that Jesus said, Take heed that no man deceives you, for many shall come in my name, 
saying, I am Christ. I was interested as to know why AJ thinks he's any different. In, in, in Brazil. Central America, there's a guy in Brazil. Uh, there's a guy in Russia. There's many people. Um, there's even in Australia, I've had three people ring me up claiming to be me. <laughs> <laughs> so that was interesting. Um, <laughs> but in each case, they don't have the extensive knowledge that I have. And they also don't display much love in their day-to-day -day activities or day-to-day -day life. So but the guy in Brazil, worshipped? he just sits on his throne, actually. He has with a throne a with a crown. crown on his head. And he sits there and people come and kiss his hand and he wants to be worshipped. It's, it's not right for somebody to value me more than they value themselves, for example. Yeah. Mm. Most of the time I get the opposite emotion, that I am stupid and, and an idiot. <laughs> and, uh, and why would anybody want to listen to me at all? So can you describe to me why you believe that you are Jesus of Nazareth? Well, I don't believe I'm Jesus of Nazareth. I, I know I'm Jesus of Naz Nazareth. Um, I suppose it's the same way in which you know that you're Thomas Leader, and that is that you've had a life experience that you remember. And for me, it's the same kind of thing, with the exception that I remember my life of 2,000 years rather than... Am I funny? What do you mean by funny? Am I funny? The 50 years that I am right now. So I remember my life in the first century, shortly after I was born, around two years of age onwards, I remember pretty clearly most of the events that occurred in my life in the first century. I remember a lot of the events that occurred in the spirit world through my 2000 years of life. I don't remember all of them yet because I've still got some fear associated with remembering some of them. But, uh, and I also, of course, remember my life in terms of returning back to earth, how that felt. And, and the experience of that, and also then having this life. So, so it's all to me one life. It's not, uh, it's not like I believe I was somebody else. Uh, I know who I am, and I know how you know, old I am, and, and so forth. And I remember all of those events throughout my life. Can you believe this guy? He thinks he's the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's not just AJ who believes he has returned to Earth. His partner, Mary, believes she is Jesus' wife from the first century, Mary Magdalene. To tell the rest of the world, very openly and plainly, I'm Mary Magdalene, there's only one of me, and uh, I am here, I have come back. I, I wanted any other answer, and I searched, I shopped for other answers, I read books, I looked at, you know, is it possible that I have a mental illness? Uh, is it possible <laughs> that some... Is it possible? ...how I've created this experience because I have a deep underlying desire to be special or have attention. I really looked at that and I, I think that was fairly easy to resolve because I was pretty much hiding from everyone and hiding this experience from everyone for a number of years after we met. Was coming to terms with the fact that you were Jesus easy? No, very, very hard. There are many, many times when I just felt like it was impossible to actually even say. I'm completely aware that there are a billion and a half Christians on the planet. I'm completely aware of how the majority of those feel about Jesus, that they believe Jesus is God. Um, I'm completely aware that there are other people on the planet who don't even believe Jesus ever existed. And if you look at the, if you analyse anybody's opinions of Jesus um, on the planet today, I would say almost categorically that nobody knows who Jesus was. And here I was knowing myself, knowing who I am, and knowing that it, that it basically rubbed out everybody's conception of what was true about Jesus. And so I spent the next three years trying to avoid my identity but at the same time trying to teach God's truth. Basically, I'd talk to them for four hours about all these fascinating subjects and they became more and more emotionally embroiled in the conversation and more fascinated by the conversation itself, only to find out in the end that this nutter in front of them thought he was Jesus, which then caused them to think that was a whole waste of four hours now and they, you know, and they got very disappointed and very upset, as you can imagine. So I found it was far better just to stay up front I'm Jesus. Now let's get on with talking about some other subjects. <laughs> AJ and Mary were holding a two-day seminar in a local town. 
I was keen to speak with the people that listened to their teachings to see if in fact AJ was a cult leader. It was soon apparent this was no amateur production. Though the seminars are free, AJ and Mary live by donation as to focus on spreading divine truth. And I'm told they use these funds to give to others and to distribute divine truth material. I saw no obligation to donate, but the people still did. AJ's teachings focused on people's emotional addictions, their fears of needing to be loved, to have control, their guilt, anger, and unless they confront and process these often extremely painful emotions, they will never be free, never know the truth that lies beneath, or feel the purity of their soul. I was interested to hear why on the surface of it, people would choose such a painful spiritual path. So can you tell me why you chose to find out more about the divine truth? Um, basically because my life wasn't working. Um, at this stage, our son had just died. Um, our son was stillborn, full term. And my partner just wanted to know, he, she just wanted to know why this thing had happened to our son. So she just went to a seminar on the Gold Coast, that's where we were living at the time, and just, she just went straight up to him. I didn't go because I was in judgment. <laughs> I said, you know, this guy saying he's Jesus. I thought, you know, how arrogant is that? And, and what a wanker type thing. And not really now, really realizing now how arrogant I was just prejudging someone. But, you know, understandable because this is what the whole world's going through. And um, being out here for two years now, um, listening and meeting him and having conversations. Um, He's probably the most loving person I've ever met in my life. I mean, look, I, I have a part in the death of my son and because and, I didn't know anything about God beforehand. So it's not about AJ. I have a part <clears throat> in the death of my son because I didn't know anything about God beforehand. at the end of the day because he's just a person who's saying he's Jesus <laughs> and it's taken me two years to sort of be honest that maybe he is but then not get hung up on that because it's about the message and the truth so these people are under cognitive dissonance they don't want to face the deception now, anybody that be walking around saying they're Jesus, you'd have to be sceptical of. Um, somewhere along the line, this thing will have to come undone. But these people have chosen, because of what he is saying, that he must be Jesus, or that I have to find a way in my mind, despite my opposition to this, I have to find a way to believe that this person is Jesus. Truths. I mean, it must be very difficult to feel that you are in part responsible for the, the loss of something so, so very precious to you. Um. How could this man be responsible for his child being born still? deceased how could he be responsible for his child being born deceased in the sense that he didn't know God because he didn't know God this has played a part in his child being born still or deceased and this is his responsibility is part of the responsibility for this happening. Where is the reality in that? Something so tragic, something so horrible, something that couldn't be predicted, something that's just happened out of the circumstances of life, 
and this man thinks it's his responsibility in any facet to think that is to put yourself under such an extreme level of guilt and now he's come to the place where he's found this man who believes he's Jesus of Nazareth, has been alive for 2,000 years, and that his teachings are going to help him to lose the guilt because of his responsibility of his child being born still. This is a situation where the person needs to grieve and accept the horrible fragility of what life dishes out to us, irrespective of God. But now it's been turned into a religious matter, and now this man's on a journey to find out the religious answers for the loss of his child. And this is just one instance. Now these people are following a person that thinks he's Jesus of Nazareth. Where do cows go to the movies? Understanding or awareness that myself personally, you affect everything around you. It's not the other way around. It's not the world affecting me or affecting you. It's like he was saying, you're, you're a common denominator in everything that happens in your life. But then we look for someone or something to blame, you know. And I, I can understand why people blame God and say, well, how, how can you, as a loving God, let this happen? You know, if you understand and know everything and you created everything, then why do you let pain and suffering continue? And, um, and this is what AJ has helped me about too, because he explained... And I think that's a fair question. Why does God allow all this to happen if he's just love? Because he's not just love. And we don't want to face this. We don't want to say or think that God might have a side to him that is evil because we're not culturalized to believe that. It would do us much better if we realize that anything to do with harm has to do with evil. Doesn't it? Anything to do with harm has to do with evil. Now, God harmed millions of people in the Bible if the... Nobody knows exactly the right amount. Oh, but yet God's loving. Well, if you harm, is it wrong to say God's evil? Is, it, is God going to be intimidated by that? No. How much better can we know him if we say, well, God can be harmful. God maims and kills. But not everything that dies or the unexpected or the tragic or the tragedy can be attributed to neither God or Satan, for that matter. Sometimes life just dishes out horrible, terrible losses and, and maimings that are just part of its course. That's why life can't be taken for granted. Now let's get back to this man that thinks he's the Lord Jesus Christ. For goodness sakes. man's soul condition has degenerated over millennia, uh, generation to generation. So, Man's soul condition was degenerated when Adam and Eve fell in the garden. It's not gotten any worse. We're left with the tab. You're, you're, we're actually born with the debt, so to speak, emotionally. And we don't understand it. And this is what he was saying about energetically, emotionally, where it's passed on for generations. So, so this is, so we born with this error that's coming out of our soul, and we wonder why we're having a tough and hard life, and and, and all this pain and grief we seem to be attracting or going in cycles is because it's already been installed, like a download inside of us. So, I understand he's up there and in a place called Summerland. And that you can talk and see loved ones or relatives in sleep state. And, but I don't remember a lot of my sleep state, um, apparently due to fears that I haven't dealt with. But it's really difficult because so much shame and guilt around that um, 
having a baby is supposed to be the most wonderful experience, but then to have ours go so terribly wrong, it was a home birth, and and then I won't go into details. But then I was investigated for four hours, like within hours of the death, as a possible. It was a crime scene. I came home to get some clothes from the hospital, and and then basically um, it was all my uh, unit and everything was roped off as a crime scene. It was the worst experience of my life but again that represents the um the devastation that's already in my soul and so i'm still trying to understand it all fully i found it extremely sad to hear that jason mm. felt responsible for such a tragic event and it is extremely sad it is terribly terribly sad to think that somebody feels responsible for a stillborn child AJ believes many of Jason's views are in contrast with his teachings and that Jason is unnecessarily blaming himself. AJ now AJ thinks he's the Lord Jesus Christ and his wife thinks that she's Mary Magdalene. Would you get tied up with this mob? Would you go even near these people? Believes that Jason they don't know who they are themselves has a part to play in his son's death because he's his father, not because he didn't know about God. And there are also many other factors which would have contributed beside Jason. AJ told me the complexities of the Divine Truth belief system are not always fully understood by the people that follow them. I understand why tragic events are blamed on a loveless God. I was interested to hear how divine truth, a belief system based on love. <clears throat> now this is the thing. If God allows harm and sickness and evil and has a side to him, whether you want to agree with it or not, that is capable of evil, it doesn't mean that he's not loving, able to love. And this is a difficult part, trying to work out between a God of love and a God of evil. You can't have one, not the other, because you'll never understand who he is. You'll never understand why Jesus died on the cross. Can explain how such suffering can occur. How do you explain uh, things like malaria and children dying of that? Well, most of these diseases, again, are naturally occurring diseases, which our body should be able to um, fight against as long as our body is in complete harmony with love, as long as we don't have emotions within us that have been unusually imposed upon us by our environment. That what he's saying then is if you're emotionally sound, you'll have no implications with disease. You'll be able to overcome all disease. I'm sorry, but I don't agree with that that are out of harmony with love, our body will be able to fight any of these uh, diseases and, and actually not even experience them in, in, in all cases. So what he's saying is, if you're suffering with a disease or something like that, you're out of harmony with love. I think that's a very cruel and horrible and shallow statement to make. So whenever anybody experiences disease of any kind is because of the lack of love that's either ex that exists within the soul of the individual that is usually caused by and in case of children is always caused by the lack of love in the parents and in society generally so what a horrible horrible thing to say almost everything well everything that actually occurs i'll just pull over here um, inside of the body of an, any, any individual, anything that occurs inside the body of any individual occurs because of the environmental conditions that have created soul-based feelings inside of the individual that are out of harmony with love. Now, in the case of a child, usually those feelings are being caused by their parents. Or their now, I just want to say something right now. Nobody has perfected love. No human being has perfected love. Some are very good at it, but nobody has perfected it. It's impossible. So what that leaves us 
to the mercy of then is, according to this man's understanding, disease and all the other stuff that's going to harm and maim humanity. Their immediate environment. As wide as there are possible emotional experiences, causes the wide variety of diseases. So obviously every single disease has its unique signature emotionally as to what is its cause. Every single cancer, for example, the different types of cancer have specific emotional causes related to the location where the disease began. If a woman has cancer that begins in her left breast, then this is all about projection she has to women, and in particular it would have began with her mother, which is a suppressed rage, which is overcoming, uh, which is over the top of an addiction. And the addiction is wanting women to do what she wants in order to receive approval from women. So if, if the cancer is in the right breast, then it will be with men rather than women. So even the predisposition of a family tree towards a specific type of disease is related to the family tree having a predisposition towards certain emotions. We all understand that stress unchallenged causes detrimental effects on the body. Mm. So on a fundamental level, we understand that emotions can cause disease. This divine truth What do you call a dinosaur with no eyes? ...who have lost loved ones to cancer. However, if what AJ is saying is correct and science can prove his claims, then he could be holding the answers for a cure for all known diseases. It was reported in the media that AJ's mother was worried for him because she thought he may have mental health issues, an allegation I wanted to get to the bottom of. My both mothers in my first century life and this life claimed that I had mental health issues. Um, so my first century ma mother Mary claimed that I had mental health issues. My soul, first century mother Mary. This is Mary, the, the Lord conceived the Lord Jesus Christ in by the Holy Spirit. Thought he had mental issues, and so his mother does today. This is this is absolutely off its chops. Quite frequently, and often she claimed that to protect me. She felt from people attacking me and finish up killing me. In this life, uh, my mother um, felt initially when I claimed that I was Jesus that I might have some mental health problem. Of course, I went along to the doctor and had a chat with him, and he was pretty much fine after I had a chat with him, <laughs> and uh, and. Of course, my mother, by the nine-month time, felt... Now, the doctor may have been fine, but I don't think this man is. ...didn't have any mental health problems, and she was quite regretful that she'd started the entire process. AJ my has goodness. two sons from a previous marriage. I was given a unique opportunity to hear what AJ's son, Tristan, thought about his father being Jesus. I definitely believe in Jesus. Um, even now, like, if... He said the next day, oh, actually, it's all, I was all wrong. Um, I don't, I don't actually, I'm not actually Jesus. I wouldn't be that upset. Um, I'd feel a little bit weirded out because um, like, I'm pretty sure he is Jesus. Like, I, I think I'd be start believing that he thinks he's wrong. Well, um, like father, like son. Um, but um, from the first time he told me, he was actually going through a lot of emotion himself. So for him, he was, he was crying and um, he was trying to process through a lot of grief, sadness, um, some of the, the memories of torture that he had, some of the fears he had of, of, of what's going to happen if he says he's Jesus. He was really scared about that. So he was, process he was in bed crying, screaming, um, shaking um, for a so it's like somebody coming out of the closet saying I'm a lesbian or, or I'm gay. This guy's come out of the closet and said that he's the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, for a, uh, I would be up to about six months, almost all day. Yes, when I was 33 years of age, um, most people felt that I had Parkinson's disease. And the reason why is because I had so much fear inside of me that I would just shake like this constantly. My whole body would shake like this constantly. And as a result of that, almost anybody who met me would first ask me, are you all right? What's wrong with you? <laughs> when I was 33, I started processing through a lot of terror. Terror about torture-based events, actually. And I didn't put them in the Jesus basket. 
So in other words, um, I didn't I didn't attribute them to my being Jesus. I just realized that at some point in my past, and at, at that point in time, I didn't even believe I, I, I had a past besides my 33 years of age. I realized that at some point in my past, I'd gone through some fairly traumatic events. I didn't know what they were, but the memories were of people driving nails through my body and uh, through my ankles and my, uh, my feet and my wrists and uh, people torturing me in different ways and um, uh, like a big stake being driven through my uh, hip on the right hand side and other things like this and and I, and I, you know I don't have any of those scars in my body at all uh, now and uh, and so I had can you honestly can you believe this guy can you believe this guy viewers I'm finding this very very extra extraordinary had no way of intellectually resolving why I was having these emotional experiences but I just decided to feel them and as I felt them the terror disappeared and eventually it got to the point where I had no hardly any terror anymore and I was nice and calm and no longer seemed to have Parkinson's. It was another seven years of processing these painful emotions before AJ came to the conclusion he was Jesus. I'm told that actually seven couples have returned to Earth from the spirit world. Some are unwilling to reveal or accept their identities, and others are coming to terms with the memories they have. Like if we did what we were doing, say, in America at the moment, where 70% of them are Christian and very, very militant, some of them, then it might not be as safe to do some of the things we're currently doing. So this man's aware that his deception could cause him harm. And one of the 14 have been murdered, but, but the rest of the 14 are still alive, and therefore it's given us the best chance to teach divine truth as, as possible, assuming the different ones of the 14 decide to do that. AJ's neighbour Dave, or Cornelius, his first century name, is one of the 14, and he's agreed to speak to me about his life in the first century. I was um, born in Sicily as a little kid there and just lived in a little house with a little sort of cottage, I guess you call it, stone one with some my parents and sisters. The sisters are a bit too old, too old. Look, honestly, can you believe that there's people like this out there? This is in Australia. I'm embarrassed. My goodness me. Really, honestly. Sisters. And one day, um, just at the end of the day, the, some soldiers come and broke into our house or like, well, forced their way in, I should say, I suppose, and um, held my father at the door with a sword and two others, there's about five of them, they come in. I was just terrified and ran out to a uh, little corner and just hunkered down and they were coming, I didn't know why they came in for and um, they, they were coming to grab me. I was just, just terrified, I remember weeing myself and they come and took me away and um, they took me to their garrison, where their army troops were. They just pretty much, I suppose, politically back then, they were actually expanding the empire quite savagely then too. And just started becoming the violent person they wanted me to be and became quite good at that. That was the only way I got love back then, or some sort of, there was no aggro coming at me as much. If I became good, I got more... Sorry about the ads, goodness. ...acceptance, I guess. I had enough of being hurt and um yeah it was in there for a long long time and to remember early in early teenage years um as you're sort of getting more in your sexual development i used to have these old haggy women that would come along and they'd take take us to them and the women would you know start playing with you and get you excited and stuff like that and they'd have sex with you and they're just like it was gross like they're horrible things but you didn't understand what's going on in your body as well. You're having these exciting, like, nice feelings for once. You, often it's just been violence. And there's these nice feelings, and they'd have sex with you, and they'd just be really nasty to you. And often times the men would come along and rape you anally as well then too. So it's just like this. This is all, this is all happened to him in his previous life. I don't want to be, look, I don't want to be disrespectful here, but come on, honestly. Horrible experience. It's, yeah, not too nice. <laughs> Look, I'm really sorry, but I've got some biscuits and milk. I've never seen anything like this. 
This is bizarre. Um, in their head as well, like your body's experiencing something nice and something in, like it's just horrific after that too. And um, if it, everything was just to mentally screw you up basically and just become a machine. Cornelius has still come to terms with his first century existence. There are chunks of his life he has yet to remember, but he vividly remembers his final months on earth when he met Jesus. And so, I guess one of my slaves was sick at that stage, and um, I took the slave to see this guy. I want to see what he, like, if he, if he is who he is, to prove it to me. And he actually healed the, the, my um, slave and just gave me a lot of faith that what he's saying was true. It was my men that actually had to go, and me in charge of them, that um, had to go and do the execution, basically, or the crucifixion, as they call it. And, um, Are you finding this hard to believe? Is this for real? Like, is this... I'm so sorry, but... Um, yeah, by the time we got up there to do it, and um, I was the one that was actually leading them and nailing him down to the post thing he's on. And um, I was going to do... He had his hands pulled back to do it on his hands and his wrists, and he was just looking at me, and I looked at him, and I, I just couldn't do... I couldn't do anything violent to him. Because I could feel he's just different and he had love coming from him. And that was so rare in those days and it's something that I was always looking for and had a real faith in. And he's already shown me that he actually, like all the things he'd done. This man believes that he was one of the soldiers that nailed the Lord Jesus Christ to the cross. I could see there's a lot of love in him, so yeah, I couldn't do it. I couldn't be violent anymore, I just couldn't do it. And so I just walked off. So they hung me like that and crossed at the wrists <coughs> because if they hang me through the hands, then my hands would tear apart and not bear the weight. But the weight could be borne much better by hanging a person through the wrists and nailing the feet crossed over like so. And then they stood me up. Um, now, at that time, there's all this pressure. And because you're hanging like this, there's a lot more pressure than like this. So he's saying he was hung in the likeness of the JW theology on a stake. Isn't that interesting? The same deception rather than crossways on a cross. This is very interesting, isn't it? Hmm. It's hanging. There's no way to support yourself so much like this. So I tore apart quite rapidly. Yeah, they found me and started to, they took me to a main area, the main sort of public area, and they um, tortured me there for quite a long time. I was pretty much, I embarrassed the whole um, Roman Empire by walking off, and they'd cut my penis off as well, and eventually ended up um, opening my stomach up as well, disemboweling me, and I remember just, oh, just seeing the sky all the time. There was birds eating my stomach at that stage too, and um, just looking at the sky, I just felt a bit This is theatre, isn't it? I'm sorry. <laughs> I've never done this before, but honestly, come on. These people are out there. There's, these people are in our communities. More peace and realise the only bit of power I've still got is I can choose to die. That's where I just end up giving my last breath away. And that was it. But as soon as I died, I could see everything because that, I knew that would happen. Um, so I knew that as soon as my physical body died, I could watch the proceedings. So I watched them spear me, break my legs. I watched, and it was just my body then, you know, it's not. It's well, he got that wrong because, oh my God, oh my God. Now, actually, Jesus was dead when they speared him, wasn't he? Mm, so he didn't get that wrong. Excuse me. It's not me anymore. I, I, want, I very much wanted to be present during the entire couple of days before um, his passing. He really didn't want me to be there because he felt that I was in danger, but I felt this is the person I love the most and they're going through something really extreme and I, I want to be there. Um, and so I was. And this, is, this is when this woman was Mary Magdalene. Get your, get your chips and get your, um, 
your your Maltesers or whatever it is you like to eat while you're at the pitches because this is about as good as it gets. I suppose that for him, he was in a really high state of love and he didn't have fear. So he wasn't afraid of everything that was going on around him. But for me, it felt such a... Um, an affront, I suppose, to the love that he did have inside of him. Here is someone who is so gentle and so wishing to love everyone and to teach beautiful truths about God and someone without judgment, without violence within him, who was being basically um, tortured and humiliated. People were attempting to humiliate him in the worst kinds of ways. For a lot of us, after his passing, it was easy. It was as if this dream that we all had of bringing God's love to Earth uh, and showing people the power of that love was lost. Um, I had foretold to the disciples that, um, who were present that uh... this was when he was Jesus. Uh, I would return uh, to them so after my death and I told them that I would return to them around three days or th after my death. I calculated that time based upon how long it was going to take for me to decompose my own body out of the tomb uh, because I... Now the body didn't um, see corruption it says in the scriptures. If you would excuse me I'm just going to get some more milk and biscuits. This is amazing. It's like some kind of a joke, isn't it? It could hasten the decomposition process of my own body. So how did you decompose your body? And what all I did was I knew the laws involved with decomposition is about providing extra oxygen, oxygen to the process. And in doing that, uh, I finished up decomposing the body within two days. Oh, commercial. You might as well watch it. This is an incredible and load of rubbish. Provide extra ox oxygen. It's a matter of uh, channeling uh, energy. It's like um, if you can, you know, right now, right, that your entire body is just really energy. There's no, you're not really a physical person. That, oh God! Um, it, you know, the only reason why it feels physical is because you, we, we because it is dense, and therefore we are able to touch it, but. But it's actually vibrating energy. You know, so electrons running around the nucleus is the understanding nowadays. But once you understand how the energy flows, you can start channeling and or moving that energy from one location to the other location relative. So that's spiritism, okay? Really easy. The problem in the tomb was that there was not much light available, and so all I did was provide all of those particular elements with the energy that I had from my own spirit body uh, to speed up the entire process. Now he's talking about when Jesus was in the tomb trying to speed up the process of the decomposition of his body but it says that his body was incorruptible in the scriptures. This is quite bizarre, isn't it? So one of the things that I then did was allow myself to um, like take to pull together matter in a very similar way that I pull together energy in order to decompose my body I could also pull together matter and form the body and appear to Mary first three days later basically even though I had seen Jesus again after his passing there was still a lot of grief going on for me and a feeling that we were separated uh, even though in spirit he tried to be with me quite a lot I was still grappling with this whole physical versus spirit world I was oh interested to find out more about the spirit world, a place according to AJ and Mary, they spent over 2,000 years of their life. Where is, where is this spirit world? Um, well, mathematically, they've proven that we, there, is, there are 13 <laughs> or so concurrent dimensional spaces in the universe. Also, scientifically, they know that there's dark matter, which weighs, has a weight. Dark matter forms 90 to 95 percent of the known weight of the universe, but we can't see it. So there's all this, there's all this matter that exists in another dimensional space that 
we, that I'm referring to as a spirit world, but it's actually mathematically proven to be true. Uh, but people don't think of it that way. Does that make sense? So what people think of as heaven or hell or anything in between are, are actually the existence of multi-dimensional spaces in which our body, our spirit body, can exist and reside. As you can imagine, if you passed into the spirit <laughs> world today, He doesn't look convinced. You would still have the same loves that you currently have. So you'd still love your wife. You'd still love your child. And you'd want to let them know that you're still alive. That's one of the first things you'd probably want to do, right? And, and so most spirits within a very short period of time learn how to try to let their loved ones know that they're still alive and everything's all right and there's nothing wrong and, and all those kind of things. Now, of course, most of their loved ones are not in the space to hear that. Well, he must be a different Jesus because Jesus in the story of the rich man Lazarus said that somebody needed to tell the people what was going on on the other side about heaven and hell. And... <clears throat> Oh my gosh. And he knew, the Lord, that it was either heaven or hell. The, what this man's saying is that spirits can contact you and tell you if they're all right or not. That's spiritism. That's spiritism. Oh, sorry. I'm, oh, sorry. I'm having milk and biscuits. This is hilarious. Because they're grieving and they're upset not in the space to listen but most people who pass go well, you don't need to cry i'm still alive you know like and so <laughs> they learn how to move objects for example or so forth in order to communicate something to their loved ones on earth to indicate to the loved ones on earth that they are still alive and everything's fine and eventually we could have a society where we don't even see death as okay so it's very similar to the jehovah witnesses beliefs isn't it there is no hell, according to this bloke. As a, as a stop to our life. We don't, it doesn't hardly even impact upon our life at all. So do you believe dinosaurs roamed the world? Definitely. I know for certain because I've seen them in the spirit world. <laughs> Everything that has a central nervous system on Earth, when it dies, it also has a spirit body because... At the time of conception, if there's a central nervous system in the physical body, a spirit body is also created for the same organism. So when you uh, use as your primary function your spirit body, you can go to places where there are dinosaurs. AJ is not alone with his views on the spirit world. I met up with Pete, who follows divine truth. Another one! He's also in close contact with spirits. <coughs> I think probably two or three was probably the first time I saw spirits. Um, what generally used to happen, these spirits, I'd be going to bed like three, four, five, six, and they'd want to come and sit on the bed and have a chat. So, and some of them were really nice and some of them were really terrifying. Um, as a child, like, your fear is that you're going to get overwhelmed with just thousands and thousands of people wanting to come and talk to you and you're never going to be able to sleep for a start because once you talk to one, then suddenly everyone knows that you can talk to them and suddenly one after the other, there's, they're coming for all different levels. These days with Google, like it's awesome. You know, you can talk to a spirit and then Google it later. Um, so I think at the moment, <laughs> as a world, like we just don't realise actually the pressure that the average person is under from spirits who are constantly at them. You know, like obviously there's a lot of good that comes from There's a point there, like demons are at people and they're tormenting them and trying to run them down. From it, but, you know, we, we're totally um, oblivious to really what's happening. How do, people, how do people leave themselves open to be attacked by spirits? Well, the easiest way to be open to spirits is when we don't want to be connected with who we are or our bodies. So any time we're not wanting to feel our feelings or we want to, we want to avoid... So, Often people that have had a mental life are sick of their job or sick of what's going on in their life. We get to a point where we just want to step out of ourselves. So often in those situations, that's when a spirit will come, yeah, I can help you, I can be part of you. So that often in those sort of times that happens. But probably more in the society we live in now, drugs and alcohol, like um, that's the ultimate for a spirit. So you think of all the greatest rock songs and all the greatest music that's been written on the planet 
most artists have to unfortunately say that they were stoned or drunk or under the influence when they wrote their music. And generally all it means is that spirits in the spirit world are writing the songs for them. And that, you know, when they get into that state, it allows the spirits to be able to influence their writing and influence their craft. Once a week, Pete and his fellow Divine Truth follower, Fabio, hold a channeling to help spirits. Another one. Over dinner, Fabio talked to me about their communications with the spirit world. So we we're, were channeling one day and a person came to, to talk and it was a young boy who was an actual suicide bomber. He actually bombed himself for some religious cause. And he strapped the bomb to himself, jumped on a school bus with his soccer, young soccer boys and, and blew the bus up. And what had happened is that his dad, who he had passed earlier, was influencing him to do these things through his thoughts. While he was still alive. While he was still alive. Oh, he was a man. demon. And his father, already knowing the truth about what was really happening, still thought that it was the right thing to do. Yeah. And knowing that he wasn't going to go to this special place. So his father basically wanted to kill all the tri- those children on the bus. Yeah, yeah. And the, bad, and the other sad bit was God. with him was the mother's of those children because mm-hmm. they were on the bus too. They were quite angry at him and it just became this big of, <coughs> of anger and so, so we just helped him sort of understand that the spirit world is based on love and that he could move to somewhere nice mm-hmm. because after that- doesn't sound to me like it's based on love and he looks very suspicious there doesn't he that has happened my job's done. Mm-hmm. This guy will believe anything. He'll just go along with anything, this quote. Oh, that happened with Heath Ledger when he died. I wanted to talk through my girlfriend as a medium then. And um, just in the garden somewhere in Perth, and she said, there's someone here, and she'd been sort of talking to him just generally. And so we had a chat about it, what had happened and everything. He's really confused about what had happened and everything too. And he wanted to let his parents know that he died and he's all right. And I didn't really feel comfortable. To, I didn't even know where they lived or... I didn't even know he lived in, though he's from Western Australia, I didn't even know he's, um, he's talking about his child, Tilly. I didn't even know he had a child. I didn't even know a name called it Tilly, which is Matilda, I found yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it just, just feels odd to sort of, I don't want to walk up to some people I don't even know and tell them that your sons are right in the spirit world. And I talked to him, I can't remember what I said to him about that, but there's more important things for him to sort of work out first and try to explain what he was. And he felt a bit differently about it later too. We spoke to him about three different times. I found myself listening to things that before this documentary, (laughs) I would have disregarded out of hand. I wasn't being asked to believe or expected to. These were just genuine people telling me their experiences. Experiences they have all shared. I wanted to find out whether according to AJ, there is such thing as hell. Mm, The hells of the spirit world are the first dimension. The very first dimension of passing is at the moment in quite a very dark condition. There's not much light there. They're often very smelly. There's not much autonomy because most people there do not understand the laws involved with movement of nature, of movement of matter and movement of themselves. And it is very much governed by the things they did on earth as to what's going to happen after that point. So if you do things on earth that are out of harmony with love from God's perspective, and in particular if you chose to do those things on purpose, out of harmony with love from God's perspective, you will definitely end up in the hells of the spirit world. So So where's Jesus come into that? Where's forgiveness and, and, and all of that wonderful stuff that Jesus provided come into this idealism? So a person, for example, let's say a person on earth murdered somebody, for example. And by the way, God's definition of murder is very different to our own. Well, if I can illustrate, uh, from, from God's perspective, a person who aborts a child murders as much as a person who has committed a murder, you know, on purpose. If they aborted the child on purpose then from God's perspective, both are murders. <coughs> now, to get out of that location becomes the key question. How do I get out of that location? So we are not permanently assigned 
to that location. We're only assigned to a location, or our soul, in fact the correct way to say it is our soul is attracted to the location, because that's the location that best suits our current condition. In other words, a hellish location suits the hellish condition that exists inside the soul. Condition oh gosh. Is improve in our attitudes about love. In the hills it's a very dark and very grey, but... So it's a work-based salvation. This guy's teaching a works-based salvation. There's no Jesus in this at all. As you progress, in, even in the first dimension, at the top of the dimension it's very colourful like it is here. In fact, it's very similar to here, the first dimension at the top of the first dimension. It's very similar to what we see on Earth. And the second dimension is just like unimaginable for most people here on Earth already. It's far different to Earth. Uh, it has, you have far more control over your being, your life, your, your, you know, how you get around everything. And so it's very, very... Like a lot of people want to stay in the second dimension for a long time after they've been in the first dimension. <laughs> I bet they it's do. So enjoyable, you know, compared to the first. Because I'm sure there's going to be lots of people that have had an abortion that are watching this now that are going to be, be terrified of what, of what or angry <laughs> of what happens after. Yes, there is no. Understand that we can always change our condition of love at any time. This includes why we live on Earth. And in fact, that would be my recommendation to all people, that anything that they've done that's unloving, notice what it was, choose to do something different now. Because if you don't do that now, you will be faced with those reasons when you pass. That's how God's created the universe. Well, how's he going to go when he lobs up there and he goes, I'm supposed to be Jesus? How's he going to go, viewers? When AJ talks to me about divine truth beliefs, something is either a truth or it's not. There is no grey area. I perceive AJ's view on abortion that it is murder, very hard line. Yes. However, his belief is shared with many religious faiths that are widely practiced today. I am told that one of the reasons they have returned to Earth is to teach divine truth, a belief system based on love. <clears throat> As since his crucifixion, a large amount of religious distortion occurred, a claim that many religious faiths may find highly offensive. It can be quite offensive to lots of people. Well, in the first century, what I said was often offensive to a lot of people. That's why I got crucified in the end. Um, <laughs> oh, come on. Say the truth, what, what I've discovered to be the truth of the universe to people, but of course, People have a whole set of ideas, they have a whole set of, what, what would you call it, um, sort of like preconceptions about what life should be, but also they have a whole lot of personal and political agendas and financial agendas that, that you know, a lot of my teachings will confront. We see a lot of hypocrisy in religion, unfortunately, and one of the reasons why is because most religions have been created by people on earth to suppress and control other people on earth and not to come to know God or come to have a relationship with God in the way God defines and that's the big difference between what I taught in the first century and everything else that yeah, I Yeah, but he's supposed to be the big difference he's supposed to be the Lord Jesus Christ this will never work what he's saying will never ever 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 work Goodness! From that point onwards. AJ believes that God creates our soul, that our soul is pure, but degraded by the unloving actions of our parents, past generations, environment, and our choices. I'm told that Jesus became at one with God by cleansing these imperfections from his soul and could therefore perform miracles and understand and teach others to be more loving from God's perspective. Since AJ's return to Earth, he tells me this process of cleansing his soul has to happen again. People are sceptic about who you are. They can say, well, why don't you just do a miracle? <laughs> yeah, this is a common, common thing. Firstly, the logic of that question defies logic, actually. Why? Well, totally... If you're the Lord Jesus Christ, if this man's the Lord Jesus Christ, then why is he just teaching knowledge? 
Why doesn't he do what the Lord Jesus Christ did and perform miracles? A logical question. If a person can perform a miracle, the only thing it proves is that they can perform that miracle that they've performed. No, 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 no. A miracle is a miracle. It doesn't prove their identity. <laughs> if a person asked me to perform a miracle, in the first century, up until I was 30 years of age and at one with God, I could not <coughs> perform any miracle. I chose to not perform any miracle, in fact, until that point in time. That's not necessarily true. It just We don't know whether Jesus could perform miracles or not before that, or did before that. It's just not recorded. So I waited until I became at one with God. So, for example, if I met a blind person, and I knew God's laws and, and the feeling within them allowed me to cure their blindness and, and I wanted to cure their blindness and I had a desire to cure their blindness then God's love could throw, flow through me and cure their blindness and so they were instantly could instantly see so the only time I would perform a miracle <laughs> is He's not convinced. the feeling of love for the individual enough to actually perform the miracle and i was at one with god which i know i am not at this point in time and i do you are definitely not you are definitely not no when i will be because i've still got to work through some fears in order to become at one with god and many of the so-called miracles that are listed in the bible i never performed and in fact nobody ever historically has performed but they are legendary in other books besides the bible so, for so he's saying a lot of Jesus' miracles are just legend. For instance, turning water into wine was something that Greek gods did before I arrived in the first century. And, uh, and so therefore, I had to have turned water into wine so I could be compared to a Greek god. So that people would accept Christianity. And that's a shame because I feel pe a lot more people would have accepted Christianity if just the truth had been taught. But the thing is, this guy hasn't got a clue about the truth whatsoever. It was My the second God. day of the seminar, and I wanted to speak with more divine truth <clears throat> to help get a greater understanding of their choice of spiritual path, and to find out whether or not they actually unknowingly belonged to a cult. I think, I think I've been part, a part of a cult before. I was part of a church, and I had a lot of rules and regulations about... Um, being in that church you know we weren't allowed to dance we weren't allowed to gamble and with AJ and Mary there's you know that if anything they promote to you free will but they explain to you work out for yourself what's loving and what's unloving you know you'll feel the difference and they're right you do you know I don't, I don't know if you know but um, I'm, I'm pretty mediumistic and um, I practice mediumship and um, it's been really nice to be able to talk to a person like AJ and Mary who can explain to me some of the things that I've had no answers for throughout my life. Um, from, so, excuse me, from, you know, visions that I didn't understand to um, addictions that I've battled and then, and then try. Am I funny? What do you mean by funny? Am I Is there spirits around us now sort of helping with this or challenging in this interview? Um, can you give me a minute to just feel about that? <laughs> so it's based on what we feel? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can feel my guide with me just, just standing there. Um, <coughs> probably because I feel a bit afraid. Um, our guides are really nice people and they have a lot of love for us and often just their presence makes us emotional. So that's your spirit guide, is that what it's called? Yeah. A spirit guide. So is there anyone around Simon or I? There's no way I'd believe this woman. There's no yeah. way. I was nervous to say that. <laughs> yeah. Um. There's no way. I just need to take my focus off you for a second to just sort of feel. Feelings are good servants, but horrible masters. Yeah, you have a couple of spirit friends too. <laughs> there is... Um... No. 
what feels like a man standing here and um, there feels like a person either side of your cameraman. Marion has recently turned to Divine Truth. She tells me that she's been plagued with spirits her whole life. For me this is fascinating because I haven't, I hadn't met anybody that articulated how they felt about spirits and spirits going inside them and controlling them. So can you tell me what exactly happens and how do you change if a spirit is controlling you? I've been shown phenomenal stuff from the spirits, such as an ancient henge, probably 350,000 years old, in Tasmania, and I've channeled an, a male Aboriginal spirit. So a man has spoken through my vocal cords. Okay, so she's the been demonised. In some ways, and the negative side is being told you're made of titanium after you've crashed a car and sending you down a cliff and your face smashing in, your leg being ripped apart, and then thinking that you're fine and and going to the hospital and showing the doctors what's inside your leg and like really warped stuff as well and that's dangerous. Is that an analogy or is that actually dangerous. That actually happened and then I went into a psychiatric hospital for a couple of weeks and some medication to kind of um, mm. come down. So you know it can be extremely negative. The information that AJ and Mary, who are very advanced mediums, probably the most advanced mediums on the okay, planet... Okay, so they're, being, the they're being described as mediums. Jesus of Nazareth and Mary Magdalene, AJ and his missus, are being described as mediums, okay? That they've shared through their DVDs um, has enabled <coughs> me. It's given me the will to live and it's given me the... Um, Strategies. I'm beginning to understand why they have chosen this spiritual path. It's a dangerous. To talk to their loved ones in sleep. So state. dangerous. And knowing that your children are looked after in Summerland. An answer to questions that you had no hope of an answer. A hope for their future. I don't believe that to follow divine truth you have to start from a place of sadness and many that I spoke to didn't. However, it sure does help those who do. If I speak to the Divine Truth followers, they all say it isn't a cult, and I don't believe it is. However, I'm not sure this actually tells me anything. I get the feeling that some of the followers wouldn't mind being part of a cult, not in a sinister way, but in a way they can all get guidance from a man who is only trying to help. AJ doesn't want to be a cult leader, and I don't think he is. However, his position puts him in a place of power. There has been uh, depictions of the view as a cult leader, <laughs> yeah. um, surrated by women. Yeah. Um, Which every woman that knows me would laugh about. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, mm. is there any truth behind? No. What is said or what is shown or what is written? No, not at all. Um, I find it amusing, actually, because before I met Mary, I was celibate for five years. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we're, uh, like, now that I've found Mary, um, even, if, even if Mary left, I wouldn't yeah. engage in sex with anyone else. Like, And a lot of people imply that somehow I'm just one in a string of Mary Magdalene's and... You know that you sort of shop for women. Yeah, which... I've heard there, there's been, has there been ten? <laughs> That's what I read. I read there, there have been. AJ hasn't even had ten. Is that all right to say? Yeah. <laughs> partners in his life. In my two thousand years of life, I've had four partners. <laughs> to be compared to um, the Waco oh. disaster, what, for some, why would they do that, and how does that make you feel? Well, the why is very different to how it makes me feel. Um, if I answer how it makes me feel, because that's pretty simple, <laughs> I, I, it doesn't worry me at all, actually, because I know that we're not anywhere, nothing like that. I know I'm never going to encourage violence or, 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 or in fact, defend violence. Or have uh, a compound. Or have a compound, or be guiding people in any way to have a compound that's separate from society or any of those kinds of things. Or own a gun. Or own a gun, <laughs> even. <laughs> Where do cows go to the movies? Yeah, Dr. Jason W. Morrison, theologist, New South Wales, Australia. I've 
put this on the end. I want to put this on the end of this video because um, we've just had some family members over and they looked up this guy on um, Wikipedia just out of curiosity because we were watching him on telly like it's amazing. And this is what we found. Divine Truth, which is the name of the guy's organization, is a spiritual, metaphysical or non-religious movement based in Queensland, Australia. It was started in 2007 by spiritual teacher Alan John Miller, also known as AJ, who claims to be Jesus of Nazareth through reincarnation. In a seven-minute interview which aired on A Current Affair, Miller claimed that divine truth is God's truth and is absolute truth, the absolute truth of the universe. Now, teachings of divine truth movement focus primarily on how a person can evolve their soul in love and develop a personal relationship with God like Jesus did in the first century. This process includes prayer, longing for God's divine love, following one's loving desires and passions, taking personal responsibility for one's own emotions, as well as emotional clearing or emotional processing to clear the soul of emotional errors. Very, very similar to Scientology, isn't it? But get this. Miller has been an elder in the Jehovah Witnesses and used to be a computer systems engineer. In 2007, Millers purchased a 16-hectare property at Wilkesdale, Queensland in Australia. And in 2009, Divine Truth listeners purchased another 240-hectare property with plans to build learning centres and a visiting centre for international visitors. And hundreds of people have brought dozens of properties that are located close to Miller, near King Arroy. Now this guy was a former Jehovah Witness which is a millennium restorationist Christian denomination with non-Trinitarian beliefs distinct from mainstream Christianity. The group reports a worldwide membership of approximately 8.58 million, which is a lie, adherents involved in evangelism and annual memorial meeting attendance, etc. So our friend here is an ex-Jehovah Witness. Now look where, the, look where this poor fellow's ended up as a result of it. So, oh my goodness me. My goodness me. All I can say, viewers, is this is Dr. Jason W. Morrison, theologist, New South Wales, Australia. You make your own minds up. But I find it... I, uh, during my video, I said it sounded very Jehovah Witnessism, didn't I? So this guy's using his knowledge of the Bible, which he's learned out of Jehovah Witnessism, and mixed it with his own um, idealisms, be it whatever they may be. Uh, and I would really... Be very careful of this kind of thing. Dr. Jason W. Morrison, Theologist, New South Wales, Australia. Bye for now. Yeah, Dr. Jason Morrison, Theologist again. I just want to say thank you for watching the videos and I uh, hope you got plenty of uh, self-rediscovery and freedom out of it. If you watched it on YouTube, please share or like. Um, maybe even comment. If you watched it on Facebook, like, comment, share. Um, but most of all, get out and live. This isn't a rehearsal. You've got a one of life. Don't let your loyalty and your faithfulness blind you to the life that you should be experiencing. Till the next video, thank you for watching and bye for now.